So let's talk about Hive architecture. So in Pig, we didn't have a specialized architecture because Pig was most of a tool. Uh, but Hive, although it is again a tool, it is an engine. But on top of that, we also talk about having an architecture on top of what Hive is. So I'll, I'll give you a quick kind of you know information, guys. You know, uh, I'll you know, dig deep into that. I'm not very good at drawing, but I uh, hope you'll understand what I'm trying to put, portray here. So imagine that somebody is looking from top. Okay. Uh, somebody is looking from top. So if you look from the top, and this is a 3D three-dimensional plane. Somebody is looking from top, and you have a 3D plane. Does it make sense, guys? If you look from top, it will look like a 3D plane for you. Can you can you visualize this in your head? Yes, Samir says yes. All right. At least I have somebody who understands my drawing. Okay. Now imagine this is HDFS. Okay, this is HDFS. This is where your data is written. So I'm trying to help you out. You know, do not quote me for that. This is not how HDFS looks like, though. But just imagine that. All right. So this is how your data is in HDFS. It's a blank sheet of paper. That's how you see HDFS data written out there. Now my question is, if I put a grid here, if I have a grid. And the grid is a tabular grid. No, it, it has a tabular grid. So if I push, if I if I put a tabular grid in in between the actual data and my eyes, and if I look through the grid on the HDFS data, you know, do you think if the grid is a tabular structure, I'll feel as if the data in HDFS is a tabular structure? Do you feel like that, guys? Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Yes. So this is the exact same concept of this is the exact same concept of Hive. In Hive, what you have is your data still resides on HDFS, but what you create is you create a grid. The grid that you create is responsible for viewing the data, which is actually stored in a flat file in HDFS normal text style. It can be viewable and it can be you know approached as a table structure. So what you need is you need a grid. You need to define a grid on and using that grid you can see different folders. And inside the folders, the data that you see using or through that grid will always look like a table structure for you. All right. Now, this grid information, the grid will have a name. The grid will talk about how many you know uh, partitions are there in the grid. It will talk about what kind of data can you see through the grid. Is the Boolean data, is the text data, what kind of data you see through the grid. So all those data needs to be saved somewhere. And that is the reason why you need a special kind of server in Hive, and that's called a metadata server. A metadata server is a small database. Normally, it is created using SQL or it is created using Postgres. So what you do with this is you store only the metadata of the grid so that when anybody wants to view the table, what happens is you just push or bring the grid details on this and view the data from HDFS using or through that grid. And that's how it's all about. All right? So it's a very simple concept. The idea is very simple. Your data actually resides on HDFS. The data resides in HDFS, and uh, when you try to process the data, when you do, want to do analytics on the data, the data analytics should be done using your resource manager, which is Yarn. This is the original concept of your data storage and data processing. Nothing changes. What changes is you have something called Hive on top of that. Hive is a service. The service, what it does is it only creates and maintains different grids. And the information about the grids, like what is the table name, what is the grid name, which is actually the table name. What, how many columns are there? What is the data type of each column? All those grid details are stored into your metadata. That's what your metadata is all about. And there is something called a driver. The driver, what it does is whenever you run a SQL query, whenever you create a SQL query, that SQL query gets converted into MapReduce and pushed on into your resource manager by the driver. And that is how you create a Hive service. So Hive service doesn't store the data, nor it actually processes the data. What it does is it only stores the grid information, and on top of that, it also have a driver view where whenever you submit any SQL queries, it gets converted into a normal MapReduce program, and it is pushed. You know, your MapReduce is pushed uh, into your resource manager for processing, like it always has been. All right. Now the question is, how do you process the data? How what is how do you go and access those drivers? How do you submit a SQL query? Well, SQL query can be submitted using three different ways. One is CLI. So Hive provides you with a CLI. It's more like a you know pig grunt shell. You have a CLI command line interface, and that's called Hive interface. So Hive interface can be used for opening up a command prompt and running your queries. 
there's a high web interface. You can open up a web interface and you know, run some small queries in the web interface. Or you have a thrift service. A thrift service is nothing but a you know accumulation of a different kind of service, which is normally called as you know thrift service that gives you the flexibility to to work with JDBC ODBC connections. Now JDBC and ODBC are universal connectors, so any any database in the world which or any any service in the world which actually uh, you know announces itself as a database, either it can be data warehouse data, you know or a database. Any any service that announces itself as a data storage system has to provide the basic ways of connection. So JDBC and ODBC are universal connections available for connecting to any database. So because Hive is you know or Hive is approaching itself or declaring itself or announcing itself as uh, you know, a data warehouse, you need to provide those services so that anybody can actually access high within JDBC or ODBC. And that's what your thrift service is all about. All right? So thrift service provides a layer where your JDBC ODBC can be, or JDBC ODBC connections can be established from your external world. Now, what are the external world available? So all kind of BI tools, Hue, Kubol, Chromosphere, all these are, you know, examples of uh, simple BI tools, so it can. This can go all and all. So you can have any kind of external system which can work with JDBC or database connections. They can definitely come across and access your Hive server using Thrift Service. So Thrift is internally working on top of JDBC and ODBC. So that's what the internal architecture of Hive is all about. It doesn't store the data. The actual data is still in HDFS. It will still process the data as MapReduce program. It's just that your SQL query will be pushed through the driver, which gets converted into not produce program, and you, on the other side you have meta store. The meta store is actually giving you a way of representing or showing the grid. All right. So it says CLI and HWI. So CLI, as I said, is the command line interface. HWI is web interface, right? Uh, so it is Hue web interface. Using Hue, you can see a small screen, uh, you know, and using that screen you can go and run some high queries, right? All right. So uh, Shafiq says uh, high metadata store in meta. Uh, Hive metadata store in MetaStore. MetaStore is a separate database. Yes, as I said, normally you represent a MetaStore using a you know Postgres or a MySQL or an Oracle database. So when you create and set up your Hive, you can you have to set up a small database, and that database is actually the MetaStore. It stores only your metadata information. When a request is made from Hue, would it go through HWI or will it go through Thrift Service? So if it is going through Hue, it will go through HWI, right? So it will go through HWI, not through Thrift. And does Hive need to be on a different server? Yes, you can have so, uh, Hive on a different server. So you can install Hive on a different server. So all of these are actually, you know, um, uh, you know, you can have them on a separate analytical service, right? Uh, machine. So you can have separate machines. So you can have one dedicated machine or a couple of dedicated machines which acts as a Hive and big analytics machine, right? But those machines, even though you run your SQL queries or you run your big scripts through that machine. In, invariably, those all queries and scripts through the driver get submitted into the resource manager. So we know all those architectures, right? That how no matter where you are submitting a job from, it eventually goes and in, you know gets gets submitted into your resource manager. Shashi says, how metadata stored and accessed from the high MapReduce program? So MapReduce program knows the database passwords and you know information, so it will internally create the MapReduce program. When it creates the MapReduce program, all the data databases, data structure, and everything will be maintained in the meta store. You'll pull the data and you'll create the metadata or you'll create those MapReduce programs. So it is very simple to understand, right, that if I have a MapReduce program, the MapReduce will have to have, uh, you know, that I need to understand, you know, how the data, how the per line of information is getting stored. Uh, so when I when I go and, you know, check out the type of the data that I have in my meta store, I can easily find out that, yes, my data has, or, or the entire line is divided into 12, uh, you know, uh, let's say columns, and column one is a you know, string data type, column two is a text data or, or, or a Boolean data type, column three is something else. So all those will be taken care of uh, when you go and fetch this entire metadata from MetaStore. So whenever the engine creates the MapReduce program, the MapReduce program will have to tokenize the data and process the data. It will become easier if you already know what kind of information or what kind of data or column, how many columns and what kind of columns are stored in that particular. Right. Uh, Shafiq says, uh, why Hadoop went to separate MySQL database for Hive? Uh, can it not store HDFS? No, so you do not want to store the metadata in, in you know, uh, HDFS, right? The metadata in HDFS would be a very bad design that so we already know about it. Uh, we have talked about name node and you have seen that even in name node the metadata gets stored in the RAM. Here you want to persist that. 
want to process that because you want to query those tables as, as quickly as you want. So you want to have a very small database that only stores your metadata, right? It's a similar concept to what a name node has, right? you're storing your metadata. How is fault tolerance taken care of? Uh, I didn't get the question, Lavanya, you know, so why, how is fault tolerance not taken care of here, you know, because when you submit a program, the program gets converted into MapReduce and we have had three sessions discussing about how fault tolerance is maintained in a, you know, resource manager when, in, whenever you submit a job, right, so we know about it already. If I understand it correctly, does Hive service typically get installed or run on a master or any other servers dedicated for Hive, Patron and Data Node? No, you can install Hive on any separate box, you know, so there is no restriction. You can you know, install it on any more box, you can install it on a, you know, on, on a data node, you can install that on a, uh, you know, on, on, on a separate box. You can have an edge node dedicated only for Pig and Hive because that will act as a service layer for your data analytics, right? Uh, so you do not have to install this. I mean, there is no restriction like where you need to install it, but you can install it anywhere you feel like, you know, you can install it on a separate machine. Only the restriction is you need to have the data node and the node managers in the same box. Apart from that, Hive can be installed in any box as you want. You know, because eventually, whenever you get, whenever you submit a job, it gets submitted into your resource manager, right? Like it has always been in the YARN architecture. Difference between CLI and HWI? Well, CLI and HWI are different because one is a command line interface, one is a web interface. It's just giving you options to connect to a database. You know, it's, it's giving you options to connect to Hive, right? So there are different ways of connecting a query in Hive. These are two ways. Which component here in picture converts Hive to MapReduce program? The driver. The driver converts it to the MapReduce program. We can't drop a table right in Hive. So we can drop it, but let's not jump the guns. Why cannot we drop guys? You know, we can easily drop tables. All right, so what we talked about is uh, Hive normally have these components. It's a shell. You have a CLI shell. So CLI shell is the actual you know, place where we're going to go and write some codes and execute our analytics program and process. Metastore, Metastore stores all your grid-based information. Execution engine, the execution engine is actually executing your MapReduce program. The compiler, the compiler which converts your you know, SQL script into a Java-based MapReduce program and compiles it. And the driver, the driver is actually the one which is converting a SQL into your actual MapReduce Java program. So these are all components these are all components which can be used for processing data in uh, Hive. How the large video files have been handled by the grid? Firstly, you know, uh, normally you do not process video data using, uh, you know, Hive. You do not do it. And second thing is, guys, you know, second thing is, you know, if you think logically, you know, the data in HDFS, as I've been saying, it's already divided into blocks. And that's what I've been saying for last so many classes. The data is stored into blocks. So, even if you are seeing the data through that grid, you are not seeing a single unified view of the data. The data is actually being shown to you from different, different sources, right? So your data in, in video data is also in HDFS stored into different blocks of data of 128 MBH, right? So your data is actually scattered into multiple nodes across your HDFS, right? So similar, similar to here, guys, you know, even if you have a big file, even if you have a big file and you're storing this huge file into your, uh, let's say, C drive, you know, you can still go and check out that file, right? Internally, the data might not be located in a single place in your hard drive. But if you go into a C, just a C drive, your file system is going to show you a unified view of the data. You know, it's going to show you a small, you know, file icon and say, hey, this is your file. That size of the file can internally be, you know, in GBs, but it's still going to show you the icon of the file. Similarly, in HDFS, you know, no matter internally how many blocks are divided and how the data is scattered, when you go into an HDFS layer and you query your HDFS, it's going to show you that, okay, this is your single file. So guys, you know, this is how we have been talking about since class number two or three, right? So even if you go to your HDFS and you say how to FS minus LS, it's going to list out the content of this, it's going to list out all the files in the folder. It doesn't tell you that, okay, this file is scattered into this many blocks and this is loaded into different machines, right? That's internally how file system works, right? So you only go and check out the data, and when you go and do an LS on the data on, on your file system, the file system is only going to show you the content of the file system all of the folder, irrespective of how many number of blocks the data is divided into and how the blocks are scattered, right? So we know that part, right, Shashi? We already have covered so many, uh, you know, classes discussing about the same thing over and over again, right? That data, so for us, the file system will internally manage the data. For us, 
no matter how big or how small the file is, I'm going to see only the file name given on that folder. So if I'm looking through even a you know grid, doesn't matter to me because I'm only seeing that okay there is there is a file like this. So can you briefly tell what happens in driver compile and execution in one more time? All right, guys. All right. So first first one is uh, you know. Uh, the meta store. So the meta store is the one that stores your grid information, right? So the grid information talks about, uh, you know, uh, all the grid level or, or the table level details, the name of the table, you know, which location your table is. You know? So if you're saying that okay, my table is in, uh, you know, uh, drive or, or my my table is in folder slash you know data zero one, then the the table name and the location of your data should be managed and maintained somewhere. Second part is execution engine. The execution engine is responsible for executing a map today. So your execution engine internally is nothing but your YARN architecture. So YARN provides you with an execution engine. So why we are saying Hive has a separate execution engine? Because in Hortonworks, there is a new execution engine that's come into picture that's called Tails. So Tails is a very similar execution engine, which is similar to your YARN architecture. So let's not go into details. So the execution engine for normal discussions will always be YARN. Compiler is the one that converts your actual SQL uh, program or actual you know, Java program that has been converted into MapReduce and it will, con it will execute and it will compile the program. Right? So we have seen that Java program which should be comp compiled and converted into Java. That's what the compiler will do. It will compile your Java program. But the question is who creates those Java program? The Java program will be created by the driver. All right? So these are the things that constitutes your high component. Mukesh says, isn't the information which is which is in name node stored into the name uh, which is in meta store stored into the name node? Absolutely not. Who who loads and maintains metadata in the meta store? So, so normally, when you create those tables, when you go across and create a table, right? So you define the the table structure similar to what we do for pig. Even with pig, we create a command saying that hey, this is your pig storage, and in your pig storage, that is how your data will look like. So when you create those tables, the tables will be stored. The information of the metadata of the table will be stored into your meta store. So let's go into those you know, uh, pointers, guys. When we start doing something, you'll, you'll understand how it works, right? Do we need to do any kind of setup for MySQL and meta store before using Hive? So if you are into administrative work, and if you are setting up Hive, then yes. You need to set up MySQL and connect those SQL into uh, your actual Hive service. But if, if you're talking from a developer's point of view, no. Uh, you know, Hive will be already set up and given to you. 